listening to the Jersey Guys Podcast, the show that talks about hard rock, heavy metal, AOR, and West Coast music. In-depth conversation and special guests are always on tap, so settle in and turn it up. Now, here are your hosts, Tom and Mark. Hey everybody, this is Mark Ballow from the Jersey Guys Podcast. I'm here with my co-host Tom Coyne, as always, and today we've got special guest Danny Martinez from the band Caught in the Act and Guild of Ages. Um, this uh, was a pretty good uh, conversation, right Tom? Uh, you're very enlightening. A lot of things that I didn't know about and always was curious about. He answered our questions and he was a great guest and I uh, hope everybody enjoyed it as much as we did doing it. Yeah, no, I mean, we uh, we found out that they uh, they do have some songs in the can, so there might potentially be another Guild of Ages record coming uh, at some point in uh, the not too uh, distant future. But uh, you know, for now, let's uh, let's check out this interview. We hope you guys enjoy this one. Uh, Danny Martinez from Caught in the Act and Guild of Ages. Hey, everybody! Welcome to the Jersey Guys podcast. This is Mark Ballow, and I'm here with my co-host Tom Coyne. And today we've got special guest Danny Martinez from Caught in the Act, uh, Guild of Ages, and uh, and we're going to talk to him and get the rundown on the history of that band and what he's got going on nowadays. So, uh, Danny, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, guys, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I figured I'd start off, and uh, now Tom and I. We've been doing this podcast almost a year now, and the people we have, I think our audience is, is going to be you know, very familiar with Caught in the Act and Guild of Ages, but maybe for people listening that aren't really super familiar with you and your band, um, can you give us a little background of yourself, um, you know, how you got into music, where you're from, that whole stuff, everything kind of before Caught in the Act? Yeah, uh, basically the entire band grew up here in the Colorado, Denver area. And uh, I got my start in the year after I graduated high school. So 1988, 89, you know, kind of when the, the hair metal scene and the rock scene was, was still going strong, but kind of on the edge of, you know, kind of phasing out there in the early 90s. But that's what I grew up on. That's what I cut my teeth on. And that's what my inspiration was. So that's, you know, the whole reason why I, I became, you know, a musician and mm-hmm. gotten bands and whatnot. And so here in the area, uh, we had a pretty strong scene in Denver number of the bands that we looked up to when we were coming up were on the the, the old uh, television show Star Search. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So then the band so we had we had some inspiration and saw some success from some local bands. And we thought, you know, why can't we get some of that success too? Well, you know, we played Battle of the Bands around here for a number of years and had some member changes and whatnot. And in early in the early nineties, like ninety one, uh ninety or ninety one, we got involved with um, Bobby Barth from Axe, Axe fame. Um, he was a good friend of our agent at the time. I came out from LA, listened to the band, said I'd like to record a demo and see what I could do. So he was obviously well connected with his Axe fame. And that's kind of how we got started in this whole thing, got the whole ball rolling in the early 90s. And the band was called Caught in the Act at the time. And then obviously changed the name to CITA or CETA as it was for our first two albums. Do you have something, Tom? Yeah, I actually it? wanted to ask you about a, I, I think it was a demo cassette. I'm not 100% sure because I have a bootleg CD of it, if you could believe that. From 1989, it was a eight song, I guess a cassette called Courtney Act, which songs like Bedroom Eyes, Hold On, which is a great song, uh, Courtney Act, Girl Gone Bad. And it was pretty much a different lineup other than yourself before Courtney Act uh came to fruition if you could tell us a little bit about that cassette and how that all came about well that is such a trip that you bring that up you're the first journalist that's ever brought that up oh, you see know, that in all in all of my stuff that i've ever done no one's ever brought that up that you is so see fun. that uh yeah that that was the first recording the band had done we financed ourselves here in town it's kind of what all the bands did they kind of financed their first cassette tape this is obviously before the you know, the production of CDs that, that, that a band could do themselves. Cassette tapes was the cheapest 
way to go to get your music out. Right. And so, you know, we, we did the artwork on the whole thing. And, and uh, at, at, the, at the time, Warrant was huge. Poison was huge. So if you look at the photo in the inner sleeve, you can tell that we were influenced by all that with our clothing and whatnot. Um, and we, we put that together. Uh, yeah, that, that probably four of those songs were existing already when I joined this lineup. And then we put about four more songs together and put this cassette tape together. And we kind of sold them to, you know, at our shows and to our friends and family and things like that. And it, and it started to really get the ball rolling for us as far as our popularity in the Denver area went. And so I think that's where we got a little bit of interest, you know, out of the gate coming out there. And I think that's um, what kind of gave us our start, more or less. So how did you transcend from this lineup, which was, other than yourself, um, a totally different lineup from the first actual uh, release? How did you move from these guys and, and start what became, at that time, the classic Courtney Act lineup? Right, right. Um, just, I, I think, I think you kind of wean people out and you find out who's, who's really serious about where you're going. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of, you kind of get a sense after a period of time, who's in it for the long haul, who's serious about it, who has, you know, the, the wherewithal to be in that. It takes a certain type of person to, to grind it out, you know, yes. and, and little by little, we would find, you know, this guy wasn't right for it or, you know, where we maybe want to move in this direction. So the first one that we replaced was our guitar player. And we brought Anthony Trujillo, who's with me, you know, to this day. He and I met in 1986 in high school, hmm. and we started we started playing in the band together. And we've been playing together since then. And uh, I brought him into the fold once I joined the Cottony Act about a year into it. And then our music really started to change. Then we kind of switched out our keyboard player. And then we, he, he had an influence on the band that had sort of a sticks sound to it. And then uh, uh, our drummer left. You know, and, and the Marone brothers were the backbone of the band. They were the drummer and the bass player. So once the drummer left, it, it left kind of a big hole. Uh, then, you know, we replaced a drummer, him with a, a number of different, different drummers. The bass player ended up leaving at the time. And then we got what, you know, what is the lineup you know, present day or, you know, the classic lineup in, you know, 94, 95. So just, you know, little by little, you kind of you kind of wean people out, you know, you find out who's serious about it, who's not. Did you ever think about taking some of those songs and encompassing them in the first album? Because there, there were a, a couple of real jewels on... Uh... We did. Yeah, we did, actually. Uh, we probably... I know there's a demo floating out there. I don't have it in my possession, but I think I know who does. It has some of that that we might have tried to modernize some of it. Okay. But to be honest with you, once those members left, that, that whole... All eight of those songs... We're, we're kind of tossed aside and mm. we thought at the time at the time we thought man we're, we're such a different band now we don't sound anything like that so we never kind of revisited them a little bit you know i think we tried to rework some stuff early on but it never did kind of work out was the song caught in the act part of that session or is that something separate well i think that's i think that was something separate okay yeah because yeah, uh, it yeah, wasn't definitely. actually on I, I for some reason i have uh, a cdr of that song which was really, mm -hmm. really good. And I, I, the song Hold On, I thought was exceptionally good. There were a couple of really strong songs on that on that early stuff that I, I thought was standout. That's crazy you bring that up. That's <laughs> Like I said, you're the first one. <laughs> well, we, uh, we, we, we dig deep here. We, <laughs> you do dig deep. We, that's what I, I, honestly, and this is just a 30-second aside, when we started this podcast, we, we're two music nuts, and we really wanted to separate ourselves out from the hundred other podcasts that are out there. And uh, we've, we've caught many artists off guard by things that they had no idea <laughs> or even forgot Anyone about. Didn't know about. Right, right. right. Know, for sure. <laughs> so you're, you're not the first one. We're going to move to the yeah, first okay. full-length album because mm -hmm. I have a lot of commentary about that. And, well, that was uh, uh, yeah. 1995. 95, so. yeah. So how did yeah, that... Uh, I know Bobby got involved. Uh, you know, that's pretty been well documented in all the magazines well and stuff yeah. um right did you guys base your sound and direction kind of on x or was that just the fact that bobby was kind of leading the way no i think i think that uh it, it was uh, you know we, we trusted bobby at the time 
because he opened doors that we could never open ourselves. Right. And so we were like, okay, well, we're getting somewhere now. We should maybe. And so we trust them a little bit more with everything. Um, and, you know, th there, there were some battles in the studio when we were recording it. And to be honest with you, the funny thing about that first album, and then, the, you know, the first, the first pressing of that album was on Empire Records yeah. in Sweden. I remember that. And then we, and then we changed labels midway through the printing process of that. So it was kind of a trip for us and we didn't know which way we were going. And we had no knowledge, no knowledge of what the European scene was like or what the record scene was like at all. So this was all, we were just entrusting everything, you know, to our, to our agent and our manager at the time who was Bobby and also a producer uh, and just, you know, kind of just kind of letting him lead the way. But the sound of it, uh, we recorded that CD twice. Oh, wow. We recorded it. Yeah, we recorded it in a studio in downtown Denver. The studio ran out of money. You know, we had paid them a lump sum to finish it. They ended up running out of money. And so we had some stuff on, uh, on the old digital files, which were VHS tapes. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were made in the digital files that way. Yeah. Uh, and so we had these this music and whatnot on there. And then I think the album was pretty darn near near completion. Bobby wasn't happy with it. So he ended up building his own studio in his basement and we helped him build it and put it together and whatnot. And then we kind of re-recorded the album again, only keeping a few tracks of this and that. Oh, wow. And that's how the, al the album that you hear now is the second, you know, uh, recording of it. How long and of a period yeah, was there between the first oh, and second God. recording? There, there was no period of it. It was like we were done in the studio and we were recording, you know, soon. You know, Bobby, I think, had uh, wanted to do that all along. He wanted to do it in-house all along and not spend the money at a studio to be able to just kind of relax and record as we went along without having the pressure of knowing we're paying for the clock. And so there, it was pretty seamless as far as when we started recording, you know, the, the album a second time. And like I said, we did save some of the tracks from the studio and we kind of incorporated them, but we did do a lot of the stuff over again. I know I did my vocals twice wow. for that album. It was, and it was, it was, it was a rough period. Uh, it, it made me, it made me not want to record again <laughs> because it was just such a grind and I, it, there was no more fun in recording to me. It was like, man, I just want to get this done. Well, so how, when I listened back, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say how long of a period, because I mean, obviously the Tom talked about the demo cassette that you guys put out was was yeah. in 1989. Um, the first right. album doesn't hit till 1995, so we're talking like a five right. six year period. How did so, were songs written um, for what was going to be an album uh, many years before, or were they just after you met Bobby? You know what? There was a period of time, and we have demos on all that stuff of of a lot of music that we recorded with different lineups ah. and written and recorded in. Uh, Anthony on guitar is notorious. He remembers all that stuff. I couldn't mm -hmm. even tell you, but he remembers all that stuff. And he'll, in between songs here and there, he'll just start this riff and he say, you don't remember that song? I'll say, no. <laughs> he goes, oh, it's this song. And I'm like, oh my God, you're kidding me. <laughs> yeah, I remember that song. Now, so there was, there was a number of, of tracks that, that we had written uh, in between that, that particular cassette tape and the first Cotton the Act rec uh, uh, CD we've yeah. done. Oh, wow. So, you know, of, of that stuff, I know, I know some of it was demoed to be on the first, but it never made the cut. Mm. It, Bobby, didn't, Bobby didn't feel it was strong enough. A lot of that stuff was strong enough to be on, on the CD for a debut album. And that's why you'll see on there, there, was a, there are some songs that, you know, a couple of Axe covers that we did. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's some other stuff that other people had written, you know, uh, Bobby had written himself, like No Heroes. Uh, two hearts on fire, mm -hmm. um, great things songs. like that. Uh, yeah, great songs that you know. We were like, I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know that he was like, I just want the debut to be strong. And he says, I don't. I'm not trying to slight you guys as songwriters. Oh, okay. But but I need it to be strong out of the gate so that you guys. He said that I need it to be strong out of the gate so you guys can have a career. Yeah, well, especially that at that time. Sense. I mean, it was like yes. a, Yeah, you needed something like that to to kind of get yeah, people's attention. Right. Exactly. Well, it was it was the album that I called the savior of melodic rock at the time. Oh yeah. Um, there was it was to me vintage late eighties 
uh, melodic hard rock at its best. And it was a treat to all of us fans in the middle 90s to uh, stumble upon this, this giant of a record. And to this day, I think it has stood up 110% as, as good as the first time I heard it 25 wow. plus years later. That's great to hear. That's yeah. awesome. And, um, That's awesome. What I want, what I wanted to ask you about this record also was um, when you guys were recording it. And now, now again, we're talking middle '90s, and I don't even want to mm-hmm. rehash what the middle '90s were like in the states. <laughs> Did you feel that this was going to have an impact? And if you was going to have an impact, where did you think it would have an impact? Were you kind of sold on it was a European market or? What was your thought process in the whole recording of this in 1995? It, it, it was, uh, I think, we had never been to Europe before. So we didn't know what that scene was like. You know, so we, we, would, we would go on the road as a cover band here to make a living. So we'd play six, five, six nighters and we'd travel the Western United States just making money, trying to survive. And we would write these songs in these places we'd stop, you know, Casper, Wyoming, uh, Boise, Idaho, you know, we would write the, the songs for what would be our first two records, mm-hmm. not knowing who's hearing them, not knowing who, what kind of impact it would be. We were just writing songs because we knew there was a deadline and we knew we loved what we did. And so we had no thought other than, you know, the, the next road trip or, you know, even, even, even that show that night. So yeah. we had no foresight to know anything about that. We didn't really understand the impact of any of it until we went on our first European tour when we went and supported Pink Cream 69 on one of their tours. Mm. It's a whole different scene than the States, especially what the States were in, in that the time. 90s. Because yeah. you were right. kind of, if you weren't really plugged into this, you were kind of led to believe that this music was done. But if you yes. were plugged into it, you realized it wasn't done and it was still pretty vibrant in, in Europe, very vibrant in, in Brazil, Japan, other places. Right. I, I know you guys got signed to Zero Records in uh, in Japan yeah. at the time, which I uh, remember yeah. Burn Magazine gave you as a phenomenal review. So the album did really take off outside of the States for that time, I thought very well. Were you guys pleased with how well it did? Oh, we were ecstatic. We couldn't believe it. Um, and I, you know, to be honest with you, uh, the most surprised out of anyone was Bobby. Bobby was shocked. Really? He was like, oh, <laughs> this, this thing is kind of taken off for you guys. Nice. This might open some doors. And we thought, okay. So we got excited. And then, and then we started doing press for the first CD. And I was doing interviews. Uh, and it was, it was my, as a young boy growing up reading, you know, a hit parader magazine, or Cream magazine, and having all the posters on my wall, mm-hmm. I had practiced my autograph a million <laughs> times. I, I was going to be a rock star if it killed me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. And so the, fir- the first time I did an interview with a, with a magazine in Europe, whatnot, I was ecstatic. And then I did another, and then another, and then another, and then another. And then I started to think, man, this is taking off. Meanwhile, I got to get ready for a cover gig at the bar at six o'clock. You know what I mean? Right. It's a, it was right. a trip juggling because, two different you know, worlds, right? And two, we've heard two, this from two completely a, different worlds, right? It's a lot crazy. of different musicians of of from the states that had the same success you guys had. That you went over there and you were a star, and you came home and you weren't a star. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, I was. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, at this point, you were signed to, I, I know you, it came out in Zero, which was a big deal back at, to get a right. Japanese deal. And you were mm-hmm. on Empire. And where did it go from Empire? Did it go straight to MTM? Yeah, from Empire, it went straight to MTM. But that's because uh, a third of the owner of MTM was with Empire at the time. That's Magnus? So he took us kind of, yeah, with Magnus. Sorry. Yeah. He, he took us over and said, this is a better deal to go there. And it was, it ended up being wonderful for us. Well, that was just, uh, just a year later. You're now kind of back and you had that little success. And now you come back in 1996 on MTM and you got the Heat of Emotion album. Um, how, right. you know, how quickly you followed that up pretty quickly there, huh? We, you know, as soon as we had put out the first Cotton Act record, we started writing with, uh, with, with the Heat of Emotion record. And uh, we did a lot of road trips, and we did a lot of writing on that one. But we set out, after having 
the success that we had on the first CD, we were hell bent on writing our own music. We were like, you know, we were really adamant about putting our, you know, stamp, kind of stamp on right. it. Mm -hmm. We didn't we didn't want people to think that, you know, we were just covering a bunch of songs and we weren't songwriters. We were like, we've been doing this too long now. And so uh, the success of the Heat of Emotion album is really, really satisfying, and gratifying to us, you know, because we knew what what we put into that one. It's it's a it's a really good follow up to the to the debut. I thought it was pretty much on par with it. Yeah, the, the songwriting, definitely. maybe a tick even, even maybe better even a there. tick even better. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if possible, but. It was, and I, I think maybe as much as Bobby did for you guys, I think that you needed to get out from underneath the stigma of the axe like, uh, label because I, I, I knew, you know, even from talking back in the day and even talking recently, there there were certain people that felt like, oh, you know, like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it was Bobby Bar Bart's band and that was his baby. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I guess this, sure. this sophomore effort, you needed to kind of show that that wasn't totally the case yeah we wanted to and that was that was strictly by design because we wanted not so much out of the shadow we just wanted to let everyone know that we, we could as well you know put out something that, that everyone would enjoy right now my next question is something you rarely see with a successful band is a name change and what led to Courtney Act to Guild of Ages oh boy that's tough and that's yeah. That's where it all took a turn. It all took a turn when we had to change the name. So we had this name Caught in the Act, or CETA as we put it, C-I-T-A. And then right after the Heat of Emotion album came out, we went on tour with Pink Cream 69, and we were out in Europe. Well, uh, despite, you know, the music not being as mainstream, you know, as you might think, uh, even in Europe, uh, there's a boy band of Scandinavia with an Incogni Act, hmm. and they're enormous. They were really famous out there, and they st they took the CITA as well. Uh, hmm. And our, our label was we were late in getting anything as far as copywritten in Europe, hmm. um, and they ended up taking us to court. Yeah. So they got they got a lot of money and a lot of powerful lawyers, and they won the suit against us. So we were forced to change the name. So if you look at the ascension of, you know, the, the sales on our first album, the sales on Heat of Emotion, the second album, and then when we put out the next album called Entitled One, cut completely in half. And so it was like everybody knew who we were, everybody knew who we were, and then it was like, we don't we know where they went. Where'd this band go? Mm. And it was in the days before social media or, you right. know, widespread internet access. So we tried to get the word out as best we could, but it, it really failed. It yeah. really failed. Yeah, you're and, right. What um, do you what do you do when you say before the whole internet thing and took off? It's like how do you get the word out, right? Yeah, it, it was just it was just uh, it, it it really really put a damper on everything because um, uh, even though you know the labels tried their best to do what they could, um, you know people were looking for the Cotton Act or the CETA. You yeah. know they, they they didn't read into what they needed to read into. And that's when everything changed for us, really. How did you arrive on the name of Guild of Ages? Um, we kind of just threw it. It's it's so hard when you're when you're I when you you know you have a name, your identification is that name, and you buy into it, and then you start putting product out underneath that name. And somebody says, "What would you do? You know, what would your name be if it wasn't this?" I have no idea. None of us came up with anything good. You know, everything was just kind of goofy, or it didn't sound right, or wasn't anything i think it was bobby that suggest, had suggested something more cerebral like a guild or a group of something mm -hmm. um he was trying to think of something like elements like air or water or something and he came up with the guild of ages we were up against the deadline with it and we were just like you know we don't have anything better than that we're going to go with that so we just kind of went with it and so it's kind of been you know our identity since then and but uh, you know we didn't have anything really great to, to call ourselves we were really kind of bitter about having to change it in the first place but we had no choice yeah. so you know i don't i don't think anyone was in the frame of mind to really find something that you know I, mean, I don't know if it would have made a difference either way did that album rebound in in terms of sales or with that initial guild of ages record did it take a, a hit 
overall of what potentially Courtney Act would have done? Yeah, no, it really took a hit. And we, we, we feel like the one CD that we did, it's, it's entitled One, was one of our best efforts. We thought it was great on the coattails of the heat of emotion. We had just come back from Europe and we were inspired by what we had seen there and what we felt there. And especially being on tour with Pink Cream 69, we saw what they were doing. And we thought, we thought, okay, you know, we think we need, we know where we need to go as far as the next record goes. And as we started recording it, we had to come up with a different name. And that was really hard. Mm. So uh, I think it, I, yeah, I definitely think it affected everything. I mean, for me as a fan, it's very interesting to learn all this because I didn't even know about the fact that you guys had to give it up because of another band. And I remember at mm. the time being perplexed by a band mm-hmm. that had put out two great albums, why the hell would they change their name? You know, and I remember oh, that, was, that was something that was going around at the time. Like, you yep. know, it's the same guys, it's the same music. Why did they change the name? But yeah. Right, yeah. And, it, and it's kind of weird how, uh, you know, just, just the initial perception of something like that, exactly what you just said. And we went back for another tour with Axe on, uh, for the one CD as Guild of Ages. And the people that we saw the first time around, we didn't see them again, right? Because they didn't know who we were. Mm. So yeah, it was it was really daunting. Did you feel by the time of the next uh, album that you had recouped enough fans, or were you still playing, you know, catch up? I I, I really felt like we, were, we we knew we were playing catch up at that point. We were hoping the name would catch on and people would catch up, and it, let's let's just keep putting something out, and you know it'll catch up hmm. so we rushed to put the next album out which was vox dominatus right and we really rushed to put that out and it, it, it it's uh, it's all of our nobody likes that cd <laughs> everyone knows it's rushed and everyone knows we just kind of put it together to get it out there to get the name out there again and so it's our least favorite collection of songs that we've done were you guys touring at the time um in europe yeah yeah, we toured on that first one, and then we were going to go back for Vox, and uh, the record sales weren't strong enough to bring us back over. And so we really felt the pinch at that point, and we thought, man, things are really slipping, so we need to make the last record. You know, what ended up being our last record, we didn't know at the time it would be our last one. We need to make that one strong again. And so we, you know, we ended up, did end up putting up the Citadel album. Yeah, so that, that's that 2001, and that's the... 2001. The, yeah, and it's Citadel. So, yeah, talk a little bit about that. And that's the one, I, you know, that's probably uh, my favorite CD of all of them. Really? Um, okay. I, I liked the production on it. Um, we got to take some chances that we weren't quite, a, we weren't, I don't want to say allowed to do. We had a lot more freedom as far as um, recording artists, so to speak, at the time in the studio bobby at the same time was recording an axe album so he didn't micromanage us like he had on the, on the earlier stuff and so we had a lot more freedom uh to kind of produce some things a little bit and whatnot and so i guess from a from a um you know from a personal standpoint it's it's one of my favorites um and i just think that it's it's interesting because you always look back and you can always chronicle as a musician as a songwriter what was going on in your life at that particular time you know you look at the copyright date on the album and you you read the lyrics and you listen to it and you're like ah yeah i remember what was going on at that time and it was kind of a dark period you know in my life and whatnot and, and as as an artist you you, you put it out there in, in music form and and hope it, it evokes emotion from other people too so excuse me it was interesting and that's that's probably my favorite Hmm. of all of them it, it is but a strong probably, album especially the first the first couple of songs out of the shoot are really really strong yeah right yeah i, I like it a lot so i mean and, and it's probably for those reasons more than anything now at this really point did, did you guys rec- did you finally recoup where you were with the first two caught in caught in the axe what, what was the band back on its feet in terms of popularity in terms of popularity no no, and I know I, I know that we had made a really hard push with that one to get it done and to try and make something out of it. And then you figure from 1994, from the first album until 2001, how much the musical landscape had changed yeah, at that point. True. And we're trying to we're just trying to tread water at that point. We got some early success, but trying to you know get that success back. And now it's 2001. And you put something out there, 
and you know you look around at what was going on at the time and it and it was it was really really different at that point so we never never did get back to that but it's funny that you know uh, years later you know everyone talks about the first two cds and i i really understand it and i i, I get it now looking back many years later now at this point did you guys had obviously and it's like a 13 year hiatus until the next album mm -hmm. which we're going to talk mm -hmm. about in, in depth did you put it on ice with the intentions of starting it up at another point or was it put down and resurrected out of the blue yeah it was put down and resurrected kind of out of the blue years later we recorded the citadel album and then anthony uh uh, ended up having twins with his wife at the time. They had twin boys. And so his life changed drastically. And uh, he had to decide whether it was he wanted to continue on as a musician or if he needed to, you know, make a decision financially, you know, to take care of his family. And, that, and that's what he ultimately did is he, has, he ended up just having to stop play guitar and go nine to five it, you know. Mm. And he moved to, moved to Ohio and nine to five did there and whatnot and and it was heartbreaking for me knowing him since 1986 and all he ever wanted to do is play guitar and so but but i but i understood i understood you know i understood i he had to make that that was a tough decision for him and i'm sure he you know he thought about it at length but he ultimately had to make the decision and we thought we'd we'd go ahead and, and try this new guitar player and and try writing with him and, and figuring it out and it just never did click it never had the chemistry that it did with you know james on, on bass guitar steve on drums me on vocals and ants on guitar it never did have that same chemistry and so we knew that we could never put anything out under the name you know taught me after guild of ages again without anthony writing mm -hmm. you know the guitar parts or the music to it and so we we had to we had to figure it out and we said you know let's Let's just go our own separate ways for a while and see what happens. And then it ended up being 13 years, you know, <laughs> before we, you know, kind of reconvened. Now we had, we had, you know, kind of been friendly together and every now and again, uh, you know, somebody's cover band would be playing with someone else's cover band and we'd get together and play some old songs, you know, some old uh, Caught in the Act songs or Guild of Ages songs, but we never really got back together mm. until 2014. Well, well, let's and, back up uh, a little bit yeah. before that, yeah. because let's talk about five years after the last Guild of Ages. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of get back together with some of the, I guess, original guys, right? And you, you release an right. album under the band name right. Uh, Relapsed, right? Yes. Um, talk Relapsed. a little bit about that. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, the name so of the album, that, Into that a was, Former State, by the way. That was kind of out of the blue as well. That's kind of the trip. Uh, the, the original bass player and drummer from Act, as you can see on the cassette, <laughs> uh, decided that what what if we did this? And I said, well, let me pitch it to uh, to uh, Mario and Magnus at MTM. And they said that'd be cool. Um, we'll give you a budget if you put some songs together and you know see what we can do. And so we did, and they loved the demos that we sent them. So we put together a full length CD and put it out there. You know, never with the intention of either touring or or anything like that, but just to see if we could actually do it. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we got an opportunity to do something, and I actually got an opportunity to record with those guys that brought me in in 1989, which was kind of cool. What was the, the influence for that particular album and that band, um, as opposed to what maybe you had done previously with Caught in the Act and, and Guild of Ages? Uh, you know what? I think it really, it, it's really, really heavy guitar from Brian Mesa, who played guitar on that album. Now, he was the one that replaced Anthony when Anthony left uh, Cotney at Guild of Ages the first time in, in 2001. He replaced him, but he, he had some interesting ideas years later that he let me listen to, and I thought, man, this is good stuff. And he's such a, such a brilliant guitar player. Um, I'm glad that he got to put something down and something uh, released because it's really good stuff. Uh, so I think it's really guitar-driven more so than you know, as, as melodic as Cotton Act and Guild of Ages was, this was a little more, you know, raw, a little mm -hmm. more rock. Yeah. Um, and I think that was the main influence and the main drive behind it. So my, my next question to you is, how did you get involved with um, Khalil Turk, who's a very old friend of mine, 
who I know for over 30 years. Is that right? Yeah, I know Khalil for over 30 <laughs> years. I've been to England to okay. visit him. Uh, we oh. still keep in t contact on a very regular basis. And um, how did you get in contact with him? Or how, did he get in contact with you? Which is probably my guess. Yes, he got in contact with me. You know, I think I think he might have been having brief conversations with Roddy Barth at the time. And he, he, I think he might have poked around and, and asked about us and whatnot. And um, I, I think he had heard that we had uh, put the band back together in 2015 to play a Firefest show in England, in Nottingham, right. England in mm -hmm. 2015. So we had put the band together uh, in 2014 to rehearse, to go out and do this. Now this is... We're all in different bands at the time and doing our own thing. And, and uh, Steve's living in Las Vegas at the time. Uh, and so when, I'm, when I say, hey, would you guys be interested in getting together and going to uh, England to play a show, everybody's going to drop everything right. anytime. And so we did that in, in, in some rehearsals. And then we played some warm-up shows here in Denver. While we were playing the warm-up shows, Steve looked at me and says, why aren't we doing this full-time? You know, why aren't we playing all the time? And I said, well, I'm, I'm into it. At the time, I had a pretty successful cover band here in the scene. And I said, but I'd leave it. I'd drop it all if everyone decided to get back together because the chemistry is just too good, even after all these years. Wow. And so we, got, we, put it, we put it back together, and we started playing out again and then started writing music. And right about the time we started doing our own recording in our own studios at home, out of the blue, Khalil Turk gets a hold of me. And I said, he wants to release the first Two, uh, two Cotney Act records, and he says, and if you have anything new, I'm interested in that. And I says, as a matter of fact, I got something. Sent him, uh, you know, the songs and had him listen to them. He said, I'll put that out as well. So we ended up putting out three, you know, reissuing the first two and putting out a new one uh, at the time. So where did these batch of songs come from? Because as as a fan um, myself, this is my favorite album that you you guys have done, and I thought the. The collection of, of songs on this album were incredible. So wh what was the writing process and where did all these great songs emanate from? I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think that the years away from from music and pl not playing because he still played. It, Anthony was so influenced, I think. He was just coming out with stuff that I was just blown away with. I mean, he had, he had ideas that he had... I, I think he had stored them away in his cheeks like a chipmunk did with nuts. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, everything that he played, he said, I have this idea. Check this out. Oh, my God. Okay. I have this idea. He probably had, I don't know how many, probably 20, 25 ideas. And some full songs that he had with, with lyrics and everything. And I thought, man, this guy's been working. I just think that he had given up music at the time, able to come back to it, and was so inspired mm. that it just started flowing out of him. Interesting. It's, it was really incredible, you know, the, the, some of the songs that he came up with. Uh, and then uh, getting us all back together in, in one room and saying, okay, let's work on this. It was like the magic was back, you know. It wasn't just playing the old Guild of Ages Cotniac stuff. We were actually writing new no, stuff. No, the, the, the as, songs are as great. As older yeah. gentlemen, yeah, as, mm -hmm. as musicians who have aged a number of years. And so it was, it was really fun. And it, it, it was a lot of fun for me uh, recording again. You know, recording my own vocals, it was it was fun again. Like the whole recording process was fun again. I was able to take chances. But then again, like I said, I'm a different musician today than I was when I was 24, 25 years old. So, sure. you know, you, you'd like to think over the period of time that you, you develop some chops and things like that. But it was fun and it was a lot of fun for us to do. And so we just decided to put some stuff together. It happened to be that Khalil called me at the time and we ended up getting it released. Well, he stumbled across, you know, a jewel of a CD because I remember when I got it four years ago, I think it came out, or at least yeah. I got it around the summertime, and I remember calling him mm -hmm. up, and I was just floored by how strong the songs were. I figured you guys would put out something good, but I didn't expect this good. It, it was really wow, shocking how good the material was. And um, my next question would be is, can we expect a follow-up now that four years have passed? You know, we've discussed some things, and I remember we did uh, the Heat Festival in Germany back in 2000, in December of 2018. And I talked to the promoter, and he said, um, you know, I can't guarantee you that you'll get paid like you got paid for this gig. 
he says, but I could probably get you on tour. And I said, uh, you know, to push the record, we, we're not looking to get rich here. I mean, if you put us in front of some fans, this is, you know, not only nostalgic for us, but it's fun for us to go out to Europe and play shows. Mm. I said, you, you wouldn't have to pay us a whole lot. We could negotiate that. So we talked about it. He said, okay, I'm very interested. He got back to me probably six months later and just, you know, he said, I don't think there's a strong enough market for you guys out in Europe right now. Mm. And it really, really, really devastated me at the time. And I remember Ants, Ants has, he was working on ideas and he probably had six to eight new, new songs ready to go. And I said, man, what are we doing? You know, does, does anybody even appreciate it anymore? I don't know. You know, we just headlined the, the last night at Heat Festival. I thought it was a high for us. And then to get the news that it, it's probably not strong enough to draw out here, so we can't bring you out. Mm. When, you know, we had offered to pay, we had offered to basically pay half of our own way to go out there. We just wanted to play in front of a European crowd again. And so we were, I was really, really depressed by it. And I'm like, man, what are we doing? You know, what's the point here? What not? But recently we've talked about um, putting something together and, you know, maybe just trying again, maybe just throwing it out there again. And But listening to you guys talk about it now, it's kind of inspiring, <laughs> <laughs> uh, knowing that uh, people are actually out there listening to it. So um, it's something we've talked about. Uh, and I know that there's, 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 demos right now that we got ready to go you know what i mean it wouldn't take much to get something brewing and happening you know immediately has there been any uh any uh contact from khalil about about it or is it just something that he's kind of no, left we've alone? never we've never had any 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 more uh interest as far as khalil goes and so i've kind of poked around a little bit there's a couple of small independent labels based out of germany who are who are always interested in anything we have to do mm -hmm. so i know that we can get you know, distribution and things like that uh, in Europe. Um, sure. So that's not it. I just, you know, I, I want to know if it's going to, you know, if you know if people are going to, and I know my core audience that I, that I love in Germany and Japan and Belgium and things like that would love it. Yes. You know, I just want to, it's sometimes as, as, a, as a musician, you're like, I, I want to know if I'm going to put it all into, that somebody's going to hear it on the other end. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you guys actually have material that's at least half of an album's worth of material. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, we do. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll call. Yeah, Khalil. Ants, I'll call Ants, Khalil tomorrow. <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> okay. I'll okay. be on the phone with yeah. him tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we got. Uh, you know, we could definitely put something out. It, it wouldn't take long to put something out. Interesting. So tell us about what you're doing. I know you're in a very busy uh, band of your own. It's been hard to pin you down, but we've hung in there and we got you. So tell us why you're so busy and what you're doing. It's it's Guild of Ages. It's Guild of Ages, the cover band yeah. that makes a living playing cover tunes. Here right. I knew I knew Ants was in the band. I've seen pictures of him. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we're uh, we're all the same guys, and we're getting ready to do the uh, big Sturgis rally. We do it every year. Oh, that's we're great. One Eye Jack, One Eye Jack Saloon. We do seven nights there. That's cool. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of fun in Sturgis because we do sneak in some original material there, and we got some people who do like our stuff. So mm -hmm. you know the lim the limited product that we do have, we do sell there, uh, but we do we play. It, it's a full time job. Is this um, called Guild of Ages? And, yeah, it's, Guild, it's called Guild of Ages. Oh yeah. wow! And so it's funny because nothing's really changed. You know, in the '90s we were on the road doing the cover thing to make a living, while putting out albums in Europe yeah. and touring occasionally. <laughs> it's the same thing now. We're still doing the cover thing to make a living, yeah. Uh, and you know, putting out albums when we can. So nothing's really changed that much. Although um, uh, Anthony and I are able to play music for a living, he and I have an acoustic duo thing that we do here in town. That's that's pretty successful. But we do anywhere between, uh, you know, five to seven shows a week. Wow. So he moved. Yeah. He moved. Evidently moved back to where where you are. Yeah. Yeah. He moved back a while ago. So he had, he had been involved in some bands around town and whatnot before we had gotten back together. Interesting. I, I didn't know you called it Guild of Ages. That that's really cool. So yeah. it's basically the band. Uh, so your chop, your, your wife chops have to be super sharp uh, with all the playing. We're, we're sh we are sharp as as attack. I'll tell you that, and that's why we were so looking forward to getting a European tour because we were like we had just put the band back together to play that that show at Firefest. And we were like, man, we were rusty. Can you imagine what it would be like now? Right, you know, that's after what I'm saying. Yeah. Seven, seven years of playing year round and wow. traveling. So, you know, we're ready at any point. 
and you know we'll, we'll throw it again we, we got our, our you know our, our show ready to go whenever it needs to go well go back to that for talk about the fire fest show you guys hadn't been active for many years um you get that call to kind of do the show you get back together you, you know you say you're kind of rusty but what was i i know tom and i have talked to some other guys we've had on the podcast and they've also played Firefest. And so talk about that experience of what it was like coming back after all those years to, to play at a show like Firefest where I, I know, and I've never been to one, but I know the crowds are just so passionate. Unbelievable. Uh, unlike anything that we had experienced before, even, excuse me, even touring Europe before that, um, we had never experienced anything like that before. What the community of people that get together for the Firefest show are, like you said, are passionate. They know every band. They know everything about you. And, um, mm. they, you know, to be off for 13 years and to come back together or however long it was, um, for them to be, you know, rooting for you the way that they were or, or anticipating your show was just a trip, man. It was, it was so cool. And the community of people that put it on, all voluntarily put it on, but make you feel like a rock star. It didn't matter which band you were in, if you're headlining or you're opening that day, they made you feel like a rock star, whatever yeah. you needed. Yep. Yeah, and that's... I'll take, I'll take that. It's amazing. And so after our performance, we got an ovation like crazy. A lot of people said, I had never seen Cotton Yak Field of Ages before. Mm -hmm. And I didn't expect that. Wow. But what we got was amazing. And so we go into the next room to sign autographs and sign CDs. And there's a line going out the door, and we're thinking, <laughs> what the heck is going on here? Again, Monday morning, we were you know, in a cover band in Colorado. <laughs> and, you know, by the weekend, we got a line of people waiting for your autograph. It's just sensory overload for us. <laughs> but it was, it was an amazing experience, and it really, really inspired and kickstarted. And that's, that's kind of the inspiration that you hear on the Rise CD that we did. Mm, okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's great because it's a shame that that festival is not around anymore. But I mean, I've heard the stories that you just talked about, and I've heard that from other guys that have played it, and and it's just I can only imagine what it would have been like to to be at one of those shows because I I've seen the little clips and the little DVDs they've put right. out over the years with different bands right. and stuff. But yeah. Yeah, everybody has yeah. that same reaction. They just said it's like an unbelievable experience. It really is. It's it was just you know indescribable, uh, euphoric almost. You know. Yeah. Well, um, Danny, hey, uh, Tom and I really appreciate this talk tonight. Um, it was great catching up with you. Um, we're really happy to hear that you've got a bunch of songs potentially you know, ready to go at, at moment's notice if you can get yourselves a, a new label. And we, we would love to hear some new uh, Guild of Ages uh, music for sure. Well, you both have inspired me, I'll tell you that, in this talk. I appreciate it. And thank you guys for your time. It's, it's a trip for me because I, sometimes I think you know, I, people, you know, kind of forget what you've done or anything like that, or you, you forget sometimes that you've done some things. And so I mentioned to my daughter, I, I have a podcast at six, honey. Mm -hmm. She said, podcast, and that's a buzzword for kids. She's 11. Right. She said, podcast, you're going to be on a podcast? I go, yeah. She goes, why? <laughs> I go, because your daddy was famous once. And she mm -hmm. said, what? <laughs> she doesn't, she doesn't equate that the guy she saw on stage this weekend could actually be famous somewhere other than, you know, I don't know, yeah. to a room full of people here. So oh, um, you guys have inspired me and I appreciate the time and I appreciate the trip down memory lane. It's fun for me. Well, um, you know, the music has kind of taken on like a cult um, underground uh, following, which is, yeah. is really where it, we, where it started out from. Um, we love that term underground. Right. We love that term. I, right. It's so cool to, to know that you're underground. I think that's so cool. Yeah, I do too. And it's, uh, I, I've been in this, uh, unfortunately, uh, so long that I remember when it was and it'd be remember when it <laughs> became mainstream. I remember when right. it became very uncool to like this music. I remember when it came back. Yes. And where it stands now is if, if you look at some of our um, podcasts, We've had um, real underground um, artists on who've, you know, garnered three, four thousand views just on YouTube alone, and we're on Apple and Spotify also. I mean, we had Mark Bowles on a couple of weeks ago from Ingve Malmsteen's band. I just band. heard that one. I just right, heard and, that and one. I mean, Mark Bowles has got. Uh, he's only been up for a couple of weeks. Got over seven thousand views on on YouTube, and probably double that on. Apple and, and Spotify. So it, it, it is a vibrant scene, or, albeit uh, underground. Right. So right. hang in yeah. there. It's, uh, there's a lot of people that are still very interested in, in all these bands, and it's what really inspires me and Mark to do this podcast is our love for the music and 
the fact that there are, I mean, if we were putting up podcasts and there were 200 people looking at them, I'd say, what are we doing? But we're, we're doing these and there's quite a few thousands of people looking at them and yeah. commenting and, you know, on our fan page on fa- Facebook. And so um, right. It, right. It's, a, it's a cool underground scene right now. And we need guys like you and Ants contributing to it to, to keep it what it is. Well, we certainly appreciate it, man. That's awesome. You guys are doing God's work, that's for sure. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's great talking to you. I, yeah. And we'll be in touch. Fantastic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Oh, please Julio. do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we definitely please do. That'd well, be great. Yeah. Everybody, uh, Danny Martinez from uh, Guild of Ages, Caught in the Act. And uh, appreciate your time tonight, Danny. It's my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care. Thank Bye. You. See you next